So those are, that is just an example of what columns and tracks travels uh, through the spinal cord segment. So what have we actually described? We have described that you have ascending or descending tracks. So the ascending tracks is what's going to be picking up sensory information all the way to your brain, right? <clears throat> so those are what? Either in the lower limbs or in the upper limbs. So if you pick the information from the periphery, right, lower upper limbs, this is your PNS, right? Peripheral nervous system. Once you get into the brain and spinal cord, that is your what? Central nervous system. So these two are part of your CNS, correct? As you pick that up, the information is going to travel up, and then at what segment of the spinal cord? Well, you have the nucleus cuneatus and nucleus gracilis. The cuneatus, we said it was going to be what? Upper extremities, right? And the gracilis is going to be what? Lower extremities. Of what? Sensation. What sensation were those? Everything except what? All sensory information except? Pain and temperature. So far, so good. So that's what we said, right? So all of it except. This is your exception. Now, as they travel up, they're going to decussate or cross over where? They're going to cross over one or two levels up, and that's going to be at the level of the medulla oblongata. So as they cross here at the medulla oblongata, now they're going to go to your thalamus, and your thalamus then is going to relay that information all the way where? Into your cerebral cortex. So this line right here, this portion right here that I'm drawing over, oh, this is your cerebral cortex as I mentioned before, correct? That cerebral cortex is made out of what? Gray matter, right? So cerebral cortex is made out of gray matter. The rest of it, of the brain, is called what? Is made out of white matter. So far, so good? Now, when that comes into vent, then we need to actually make a uh, difference between on the motor side. So that was sensory. Motor side, we said that you have upper motor neurons or lower motor neurons. So what are upper motor neural lesions? So upper motor neurons are anything that is within the brain or what? Spinal cord. What is a lower motor neural lesion? Whenever that is related to the what? Your periphery. Periphery means what? Your extremities, correct? Now, whenever you have a upper motor neural lesion, what are the things that you are going to experience? In reflex, you're going to have an increase in reflex. Okay? It's going to have a hyperreflexion. In other words, you're going to have movement that are going to be increased reflex. So if you're going to say something, you're probably going to start by having flare movements, right? Like fling movements on your extremities. Um, you also have an increase in muscle tone. That means some sort of like rigid muscles, right? So more increase in tonicity. You are going to have a present in Babinski as well, okay? So that's going to be present. On the other hand, if you have a lower motor neural lesion, then most likely what's going to happen? Atrophy of the muscle will be present. What is atrophy? If you ever used a cast before, right? You immobilize the arms or a leg. What happens to that leg or, uh, or arm? <clears throat> it gets skinnier, right? So you start losing what? Muscle mass and as well as power, right? Uh, force in your muscles. And why is this? Not because you have a damage of the lower motor neural lesion, but it's because you're not having a lot of firing to that lower motor neuron. Because every time you immobilize your arm, you use your arms every day, you use your legs every day, and that's what keeps a muscle tone. And that's what keeps the firing, because every time you move something, right, it keeps the firing and maintains that lower motor neuron alive, and at the same time, it keeps the muscle alive. If your body detects that you no longer have it, then most likely it wasn't going to do. It's not going to send more signals, and as it doesn't send signals, your muscle starts to do what? Waste, right? So you get skinnier.
So that's in the lower more neural lesions. You, your reflex is going to be decreased, and you're going to have fasciculations. If you ever stop working out or have you ever stopped doing the regular exercise that you do every day, you experience that a little bit of muscle contraction and relaxation, right? Automatically. Out of nowhere, you have muscle twitching. Those are known as what? Fasciculations. That is a way of your body preventing what? Preventing atrophy of the muscle, just to maintain it, okay? So you're gonna have a clinical case scenario based on what is an upper or what is a lower neural lesion. You want me to write it, uh, read it to you? So here you go, let me read something for you. Uh, John came to the hospital after a severe car accident. Uh, we found out through the multiple tests that we did that he was, he had a positive uh, increased reflex, a increase in muscle tone, and present Babinski sign. What is most likely the diagnosis? It's an upper motor It's an upper motor You see it? So that's what you're gonna see. Uh, you know, Sebastian came into the hospital and we found out there is definitely uh, muscle atrophy, okay? And there is definitely a lot of um, spas spasm on his muscles, uh, but we didn't find any, uh, any decrease in muscle tone. So no decrease in muscle tone is what? No decrease in muscle tone is what? No decrease, is it decrease or increase? What is no decrease? It's not, it's not it doesn't tell you if it's increase or decrease, right? There's no decrease, it just maintained. So that's worthless information. What else have we talked about? It was presence of what? Of muscle fasciculation, right? There was pressing, right? So that automatically brings you to what? To a lower motor neural lesion. Does that make sense? All of them doesn't have to be true, but if at least two are true, then that's where the lesion is. Okay? Upper or lower. Now, let's talk a little bit about this portion right here. And basically, this one is just going over the spinal cord traumas. So in the spinal cord trauma, and most of the trauma is happening due to a accident, right? Uh, because your spinal cord is protected by the bone, by the three meninges, right? The dura mater, arachnoid, and pia mater, as well as your CSF. So there's gonna be a force trauma taking place, right? And most of the time it's either through a fall or through a car injury, right? A motor vehicle accident. So we have parasthesia. What is parasthesia? Something that damages the dorsal root. If it's damaging the dorsal root, is that sensory or motor? So it says sensory function loss. What sensory? Pain and temperature? So what sensory? Everything else except what? Pain and temperature, you got that, right? Awesome. And then you have another one which is known as what? Paralysis, so in other words, you're either damaging the back of the spinal cord or the front. If you have paralysis, means that this is ventral root, and most likely this is affecting what? Motor functions, yes? Now, on the actual paralysis, that one comes in two different flavors. That can be flaccid or spastic. Flaccid, you guys already know, that is something that is what? What is flaccid? That there's no contraction, right? So that is because you have a atrophy of the muscle. So your muscles have no tonicity at all, right? And then you have spastic, which is what? It's cause of the upper motor neural lesion and it's leading to what? To a spastic paralysis, right? Like a rigid paralysis. Now, what are two, uh, what are one of the main two types of uh, affections or diseases that affects your spinal cord. We're gonna talk about a little, a little more than those. So the first one that we have here is poliomyelitis. Polio is a what? Polio is a virus, right? 
and it's a virus that is in your bloodstream, and that virus affects what part? So polio is destruction of the ventral horn, right? So if it's ventral horn, okay, where's your ventral horn? Remember horn, is white or gray matter? Gray matter, right? So a ventral horn is most likely around here. I mean, it stays there, right? So if it's the ventral horn, then most likely it's gonna be what? Motor. So the individuals can actually, that can lead to both muscle atrophy as well as death due to paralysis of your what? Respiratory muscles. So if it affects the level of that spinal segment, that deals with your diaphragm, right? Then most likely you're not going to be able to breathe. So if your diaphragm doesn't move, you won't be able to breathe, you will die. So the other one that we have here is ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Again, this is a unknown, right? They don't know what is causing the ALS yet. We don't know that yet. Uh, so this is actually, the causes are idiopathic. Idiopathic causes are unknown causes. So, the low Gehrer's disease, okay, is again at the ventral horn, and it affects motor neurons. So the individual would not be able to speak, swallow, or even breathe. This individual most likely have what? The death is at about what? Five years. Five years, so this is a really fast death. death. So the only thing that we have right now to treat is Rilosol. And Rilosol, the only thing it does is interferes with the signaling of glutamate. But that's not a cure. And still your patients or the individuals will die after five years, okay? So. Let's talk a little bit about these things right here. So we have a couple of things here. We have a vitamin B12 deficiency, which is pernicious anemia. And if you are strict vegetarian, you need to take vitamin B12. And because B12 is only found on animal products. And that damage will cause a problem on the Y columns on the posterior end. That means you won't be able to do what? Sensations in both the fasciculus gracilis nor Cuneatus. You're gonna lose sensation from the lower and upper extremities. Okay? You're also gonna have something known as a brown sequat syndrome. And this one, if you see here, that one is just going to affect half of your spinal cord. So half of your body works, half of your other body won't work. You also have uh, your ALS, as we mentioned before, right? ALS affects both the lower motor neuron lesion and a upper motor neuron. So either the periphery and as well as your brain and spinal cord, okay? And then for most of these things, we actually are in the research for about 15 years about stem cells. So stem cells are gonna be gotten uh, from different places. So for the bone marrow, uh, we can get it from the actual stem cells, which is from the fetus or umbilical cord, right? There was a lot of paths that we cannot use for research on the umbilical cord, um, but we are actually identifying cells in your skin and other places that are able to, uh, we can stimulate it and then can become a actual neuron. So they were actually, hopefully, we're going to be stimulating these things on the near future to then to can re regenerate this or stimulate these oligodendrocytes to regenerate the spinal cord uh, axons. If you're able to do that, remember the problem about the oligodendrocytes, right? They malinate two at the same time, so you probably end up with a short circuitry, right? So that's why the signal is not getting down. But if you're able to stimulate this, identify the proper ones, then we're actually gonna be solving the problem from what? Solving from tetraplegia, paraplegia, right, hemiplegia, we can pretty much solve a lot of problems, right? And that's with the stem cell treatment. Um, so here I'm going to be talking on this one about this one. Yeah. 
So this slide or this section is about the vestibulospinal tract. The vestibulospinal tract, we already said that this vestibulospinal tract is part of the VE, right? Ventral efferent, which is most likely going to be motor. So vestibulospinal means it goes from the vestibule all the way to your what? To your spine, right? So vestibular nuclei, where is that one located? This is actually found on the floor of your fourth ventricle. And the nice thing about this one is that it mainly primarily controls, the main control comes from the cerebellum. So it's linked with your cerebellum. So what is the actual function of it? To maintain what? Upright posture. You think that's important? Yeah. So upright posture as well as what? You maintain posture, you also need to maintain what? Balance, right? Because now you won't be able to walk. So as well as what? Gaze. What is a gaze movement? It's fixation on an object. When you're walking, when you're coordinating movements, you have to fixate your eyes into an object, right? So that way, if you walking and you notice an object on the floor, what do you do? You skip it, right? And that is something important for us to have. So again, this is what? Sensory or motor? This pathway is motor. What tracks? A or efferent fibers? Efferent, right? Descending. So this one is relating to another chapter. So this relates to your superior colliculi. The nice thing about this one is that in this area, there's another control, not only to the cerebellum, but to a portion of the superior colliculi. So this superior colliculi allow you to do what? Didn't we say gaze here? It's for coordinating of movement of your eye. So gazing is just fixing your eye, but coordinating movement is actually able to do what? Coordinate both eyes and look everywhere, correct? Now, as well as the inferior colliculi. And this one deals with what? Auditory stimuli. So this one is extremely what? Important. It means what? Since this is motor, whatever visual input you come in with, whatever visual input you're processing, or whatever auditory input you're processing is going out from the cerebellum into your body so you can keep balance, right? Because let's say you see something and somebody says, hey, watch out, something coming to your right. What do you do? You move to the right automatically, right? Because now you have not only visual, but you, in, you in, input it what? Auditory. So all of it are regulated with what? With your balance, okay? With your upright posture, right? Or the process of walking. That's why the vestibular spinal tract is so important. I know we mentioned about paralysis, right? So let's go a little bit more in details about paralysis and what are the main causes of paralysis? So uh, first of all, paralysis is referring to what? To motor, right? So that was a motor cortex. So anything that comes from the motor cortex is what? Upper motor neuron or lower motor neuron? From the motor cortex is upper. Remember, upper motor neurons are found where? In your brain and spinal cord. Anything else that is not neither in the brain or spinal cord is what? Lower motor neurons, okay? So then since we're talking about the spinal cord, then we have, of course, your cervical, thoracic, lumbar, or sacral. So you can have damage in any one of these, and then that is affecting what? Or damaging your upper motor neuron. Okay? Now, what are the causes? Well, let's see what are the main causes here. So we have either 29 or 23. These are the biggest one, right? So 29% of those is due to the what? Stroke. What is a stroke? Right, uh, stroke, you have, can have a <coughs> damage of your brain. And there are different types of strokes, right? There is ischemic, hemorrhagic, or mainly transient. So a ischemic stroke is when you have a blood clot that goes into one of those circle willies, right? The uh, circle willies of your brain and clots one of those arteries. So that's ischemic. Hemorrhagic is when your blood pressure is too high and one of those little blood vessels just break 
and that blood starts to diffuse into your brain. Not good. Neither are good. Okay? So, a ischemic is a progressively degeneration of your day-to-day -day functions. A hemorrhagic stroke is something that happens within minutes. Okay? So it's a big change in events. So that's stroke. What is the main cause of stroke, guys? Okay, so one of the causes of, of stroke is stress, but mainly is what? Your genetics and the diet. Okay? Genetics and diet. If you have family history of strokes, most likely you have a high likelihood of developing stroke. If you eat really fatty food, right, a lot of alcohol, and you put everything else you want inside your veins, like crack cocaine and all that, you are leading to a hypertensive, right? You're leading to increased intracranial pressure and that may lead to a hemorrhagic stroke. Now, the other one you have is spinal cord injuries. So most of the injuries are due to traumatic accidents, right? And that's about 23%, okay? So when you think about spinal cord injury, think about extreme sports, right? Uh, uh, motor vehicle accidents, right? Things like this. And then, of course, if you have a paralysis, then paralysis can cause a quadriplegia, which is four extremities affected. It can cause a paraplegia, that's half, right? And then you can have a hemiplegia, which is half of your body. This is the one that gives you the bronze quad syndrome, right? Which is hemiplegia.